Okay. Um, welcome everybody to this CSDMS uh, webinar today. Um, it's going to be a unique one. Um, this is a follow-up webinar to the ESPIN Summer Institute. This was our Earth Surface Process Modeling Summer Institute that we had in August this year. And it's good to see like so many familiar faces of the participants that are back here together. Um, but it's also a moment to share with the larger CSDMS community what went on in this Summer Institute uh, where um, we spent um, a bunch of time on like training and tutorials and presentations out of the community on surface process modeling, but also on programming and on like best programming practices and collaborative uh, work when you're developing software. Um, and then that Summer Institute ended with um, projects that were done by different teams. And so what you're gonna see today is the um, products of like about one and a half days or so of like a team of eager grad students and early career folk who had some programming experience from the, from the days before using the tools of CSUMS or the land lab uh, suite and like how they work that into like something that's hopefully useful to other people too as a teaching resource or as an um, a, a example or tutorial. So I know that, um, so we had a Slack channel during the ESPIN uh, period and I know that people had like worked quite a bit like afterwards still on uh, uh, perfectionizing their projects and like work, work collaboratively on like making this like a presentation that's worthwhile for other people in the community. So I'm quite pleased to see that there's a lot more people than just the ESPIN folk who are doing a little, a little reunion today, um, because this is gonna be useful for other people, maybe for teaching or for learning about these tools. Um, I wanted to quickly thank uh, Nicole, Mark Piper and Benjamin uh, Camfort, um, Nicole Gasparini um, for being here today too. They were like the main instructors in this uh, Aspen, um, <laughs> Aspen um, Summer Institute. And so it's nice to see that they're like here to listen again and find out what uh, were like last improvements that these teams did. The first team um, that uh, we'll be presenting will be presented by Brooke Hunter. Uh, she's at the University of Oregon. Um, and I'm assuming that you'll, um, can put up, pull up your slides, Brooke? Yeah, I um, can do that. Oh. And her team um, has been working on exploring the effects of rainstorm sequences on the river hydrograph. Okay, can you hear me and see a screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm Brooke Hunter. I'm at the University of Oregon. And I'll be presenting our group's project today on exploring the effects of rainstorm sequences on a river hydrograph. In addition to myself, um, the little Zoom thing is in the way. <laughs> um, in addition to myself, other people um, part of this team are Celia, Lisa, Tianu, and Yuval, who are shown there at the bottom. Um, um, so for our final project, we created an educational Jupyter notebook. It combines three land lab components the precipitation distribution, the soil infiltration green amped, and the overland flow component um, to explore how um, rainfall intensity and storm sequences and hydraulic conductivity affect hydrographs and cumulative infiltration over a 30-day period. Um, this, the difficulty is aimed at like undergraduate um, courses, intro level, um, but there's minimal to like no coding experience needed to run this notebook. And that was important for us because like for a lot of undergrads, like coding and math can be kind of very daunting. And so we wanted to provide like a low risk opportunity to get exposure to coding and get some experience with Python. <coughs> Um, and then, uh, but there are also like opportunities where you, um, in assignment questions we have, that students can go back and change the code and rerun it and kind of expand upon those Python skills as well. 
Um, so some learning objectives we have in this notebook, we introduced the concepts of rainfall intensity and storm sequences, as well as hydraulic conductivity, and then ask questions um, to the students to investigate how these, like changing these variables affect stage water level and cumulative infiltration over time. In addition to these topical learning objectives, we also ask or um, have some Python skills that can be learned in the notebook. They can see how um, three land lab components can be integrated in a single notebook. Um, they can see how to create a topographic elevation grid from an ASCII file and see how to create MATLAB plotlet or create plot, plots with MATPLOTLIB and um, use like CSV data and Panda data frames. Um, so prior to running any of the code, the students will be stepped through a conceptual model of what the code does. So before seeing just like huge chunks of code, they can see what it is visually doing. Um, and so then rather than focus on the code during this presentation, I'm just going to step through that conceptual model and explain what land lab components we use and why, um, and then show some of the final plots that students will use to ask or to answer questions, um, provide example questions, and potential opportunities for like expansion upon this notebook. Um, so first the students will um, import an ASCII file and set up some boundary conditions for this Hugo catchment. And then they'll visualize that um, catchment in the notebook as well. Uh, and then they're going to use the precipitation distribution component in Land Lab to generate rainfall time series. <clears throat> Um, and so we provide a storm parameters CSV file that has two different storm series types. So scenario one has high intensity, short storms, and scenario two has lower intensity and longer storms. Um, the way that this notebook is set up, if students modify the CSV, um, they can change the parameters and create different storm scenarios. Um, and they can ad additionally like add scenarios if they want to have more than two scenarios run through this model. So the precipitation distribution um, component will provide a surface water depth for um, each time step from the rainfall. And then you can feed that value into the soil infiltration green amp <coughs> um, component in Land Lab. And here is where students can um, play with the hydraulic conductivity values. And so we have this K vector that um, there's a K value for each scenario. And so here's one opportunity where students can kind of change code a little bit there. <laughs> I do want to note that um, our infiltration depth here is cumulative over time. We don't have um, a evapotranspiration or any like subsurface flow component here. Um, so that is just continually going down into an infinite soil depth there. Um, so then after the infiltration step has occurred, that surface water then is fed into the overland flow component, which will route flow over the landscape. And so that surface water um, depth in each cell is actually a function of two inputs. So the rainfall and flow from upslope and then um, two outputs, the infiltration and then the flow downslope over the time series. <clears throat> and so the fact that this infiltration um, is just cumulative over the entire time series, that is like one place where a student, if they got really into this, could try to incorporate an evapotranspiration piece and expand upon this notebook. Um, and in addition, um, so tracking all these variables, we can also look at how stage water level changes at the outlet of the catchment over the entire time series. Um, so here are some of what the final plots would look like in the notebook. We have rainfall intensity in black on the top here, and then that stage water level in blue over the time series. And on the bottom, we have the stage water level and then that cumulative infiltration value. And it also um, counts the number of storms that you see during it, um, and then the mean storm depth, as well as the peak water level here, and just the hydraulic conductivity variable that you use. 
Um, so some assignment questions that could be easily asked in this notebook without changing any of the code would be how does the hydrograph response differ between a high versus low intensity rainfall um, scenario? So for scenario one, students would see that higher rainfall intensities, you have higher um, or greater responses in the stage water level. And this may seem like a pretty simple question, but for like an introductory course, if a student has never had any exposure to these concepts before, um, it's a really good leading question. And then you can start to ask more complex questions like describe the decay of the stage water level height after the storm has stopped. Does it stop like abruptly or gradually? And then try to get those students to think about like why there is this gradual response in the hydrograph. Um, so yeah, neither of those questions would require any modification to the code, but then you can also ask questions um, about hydraulic conductivity, which would require changing some stuff. So you could ask students to require or rerun the notebook and make sure your rainfall time series are the same. So provide the same parameters and then change your hydraulic conductivity values and then ask them to compare and contrast the final plots. And so asking like, what effect does increasing the K value have on the hydrograph? What about the cumulative infiltration? Um, so they can start thinking about how infiltration rates and soil properties might affect those catchment um, river uh, responses to storms. And so in conclusion, we created an educational notebook for introductory courses that will be publicly available soon. We haven't totally finished that part yet, <laughs> but um, and it introduces concepts of rainfall intensity, soil infiltration, hydraulic conductivity, hydrographs. Um, and because it does require little manipulation to the code, um, it provides like a low risk chance for students who have never looked at Python code before to kind of get some experience and see what it looks like. Um, but then there are also opportunities to expand beyond the notebook and like make challenge questions um, for students who do get really into the coding parts of it. Um, and I can take any questions if there's some time for that. Thank you, Brooke. That's a, um, a really good overview. And uh, it's, it's quite impressive to see how much you developed it uh, again towards like students um, and like giving them like opportunities and sort of like laying out like how people could use this, which is a big step from where it was last time. Um, we're opening it up for a question. And people can just, um, I think people can unmute themselves. Maybe type your question in a chat if you can't unmute yourself. Uh, Brooke, I have a question. Uh, um, this is Greg. I um, so this is really impressive, super cool. I can I can immediately see a million different ways you could use this in a classroom. One thing I was wondering about is how easy is it in your notebook if you wanted to swap in a different DEM. So, for example, if you know students had hydrograph data from some nearby watershed, could they explore that instead, or is there a way to build that in? So this is actually something I was talking about with one of my committee members, because um, I kind of showed them Land Lab. They, they're in ecology and they hadn't heard of it before. Um, and I haven't tried to do it, but I imagine it wouldn't be like terribly difficult to do. Um, they were more interested in the evapotranspiration part and comparing how like soil infiltration um, and like soil moisture values might compare to like a real life catchment. Um, but I feel like it could be pretty easy to swap in the DEM. I haven't tried it, but um, I think it could be. And then compare those to like real values could be really interesting. Can I ask a quick question? Yep. Yeah. So this is Nicole, great job team. I'm super excited. Um, and I just have a question. Um, so you have these beautiful sequences that create beautiful hydrographs. Did you have to work really hard to like figure out what sequences you were going to use? Like how much tuning did you do um, to get those really nice illustrative results? Um, so like of the storm parameters? So I have to thank Yuval for a lot of that work. <laughs> um, he spent a lot of time trying to um, pick parameters that were representative of somewhat like realistic. I think for um, the 
scenario one thinking of um, kind of like intense like desert really um, storms where they have like these like bursts of rain um, and so he did spend quite a bit of time trying to make it look realistic um, yeah. and then I, I spent a bit of time trying to find some like soil infiltration parameters that made things look um, somewhat realistic. <laughs> I think Albert are you uh, you have a question too? Yeah, I have a question that, first of all, excellent presentation. That was very nice uh, and, and great, uh, great group work, I think. Um, so when you presented uh, the, the rain events and the discharge that, that followed kind of uh, those rain events, they were laying on top exactly uh, almost. And is that because you got a really small basin so it's very reactive when you've got a precipitation event it's almost immediately shows up at the outlet of the river or or is there something else going on so that's actually something i was looking at as well um my guess would be that it's a small catchment i don't know celia might have an idea as well she's also on this call here um but I think it's just because it's a small catchment. Maybe there's something in the code that we could like see if there's something going on, but I think it's just because it's just a very quick response in a small area. Thank you, Brooke. That was um, a great talk. Um, we're gonna move to team two. Um, they are a very large team. Um, and they worked on like fluvial geomorphology and different components of like fluvial geomorphology and Rachel Bosch of the University of Cincinnati is going to present their teamwork. Okay, thanks for that great introduction, Arena. Let me share this. And go back to the beginning. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I am presenting for team two today, uh, which is the really big team. Uh, Shelby, Josie, Eric, Francois, Hima, Vinny, Edwin, Mohi, and myself were this team. So we took on a pretty big question. We wanted to couple different types of grids within land, land lab at different scales to explore some fluvio geomorphology questions. So because it was such a big team, such a big project, um, we ended up distributing tasks throughout the team. And so we uh, did a lot of work collaborating and learning about Git and GitHub and the whole process of uh, continuous version control. And it was a very interesting exercise so here is the conceptual model for our simulation. Um, we have three different types of grids that we're looking at here. We have a large scale rectilinear grid representing our upland catchment. We simulate storm events on the upland catchment gather those in and feed them to a network type grid, which is the uh, vector channel network that you see going across that upland catchment with nodes along it. So there's our network grid. And then uh, we transport sediment along the network grid and we take the results from the network grid and pass them to a finer downstream floodplain where we simulate the infiltration from that storm event. So here are the learning objectives that we addressed with our uh, simulation. And we have two sets of learning objectives. Uh, the one is the software engineering and the other is the uh, flu geomorphology, fluvial geomorphology problems. So our software engineering objectives are all um, within Python and we built this in a Jupyter notebook. And so here we're looking at coupling different types of grids the uh, rectilinear grid with a network grid. And uh, let me take a moment to point out that that uh, is a novel contribution to the land lab ecosystem, that type of coupling. Uh, 
did not yet exist. And then uh, communicating the output between these types of grids. And then we coupled uh, existing land lab components on that coupled grid framework. And we use that to address our fluvio, fluvial geomorphology objectives. Um, so here we're looking at the effects of rainfall intensity, uh, rainfall distribution, sediment supply, and then the infiltration properties downstream. So this is just kind of a brief overview on how we did that first step of grid coupling. We used the same sample catchment DEM that you saw Brooke present in uh, for team one. And from that, we extracted the channel network and then laid a network grid along that channel network, identified the nodes and made sure that it was all communicating smoothly. We then took that output and fed it down to this finer grid in the lowlands where we were able to adjust for the cross-sectional topography of the floodplain, as well as variable hydrologic uh, conductivity within the floodplain. And then these are also parameters that uh, students could change within the code in order to explore questions. So here's just one example of that kind of parameter exploration. So learners can do this within the code, changing things directly, or we can have things like this slider where uh, students don't have to have a lot of coding experience and they could change, for instance, this threshold, which controls the density of channel generation when you extract the network grid from that upstream raster grid. And here are the results. When you run the whole simulation, we have rainfall in the upland and it transports down through that network grid. Oh, that went too fast. Sorry about that. And then um, you can see the sediment transport in the histogram as sediment is moved downstream. And then the results from the upland grid feed into the floodplain grid. And you can see the inundation of the floodplain on the right. So we were able to accomplish that goal of coupling these different types and sizes of grids. And so I wanted to share with you kind of the next steps we have in mind. Um, this is still a work in progress. We've been communicating uh, since the end of ESPN and having Zoom meetings and we're continuing to work on the automation of linking that upland catchment to the lowland floodplain. Um, we're working on different types of visualization, including that, that sediment transport. You notice we didn't have a, a um, video showing the uh, sediment parcels moving downstream. We're still working on that. Um, we have the beginnings of questions to deliver this as a, a lab, and we're continuing to develop those, as well as building a tutorial to help other people who might want to a uh, couple a uh, raster network, uh, sorry, a raster grid to a network grid. And so here is the uh, link to our GitHub repository, if anyone would like to go and see what we've been up to. And uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing and hand over question fielding to my teammates. Go for it. Um, with questions. It looks like everybody can just unmute themselves and uh, ask questions if they want to. Excellent, Rachel. Oh, and credit to Shelby for the artwork, which is amazing. I can ask a question. I will just monopolize all the time if you let me. Uh, so this is really cool, and it's really interesting that you were able to couple things that had never been coupled before. 
Um, so I'm guessing that took um, some massaging. So when you made your notebook, is this more like designed for developers so that they can use, I don't know who to do it, they can use these or is your notebook more geared towards students? I think it might be geared more towards, I'm thinking of graduate students who are thinking of using, trying to couple components that maybe use different grid types, but we could be, there could be grid types other than the ones that we choose that could be helpful. This knowledge and Shelby uh, and Hema have been working a lot for a while trying to figure out how to do this. It's not a simple thing. Yeah, we were hoping to maybe make that grid coupling between the raster and the network sort of an importable module. Um, it's sort of at an awkward place in between where it's all in the notebook, but it could be packaged into a, a Python script. I've got a quick question if I can. This is really, really impressive and super, super cool. I'm curious, what were you using to get grains to transport into that river network? Like which of the, the modules, I, I, I was probably up there at some point, I just missed it, but like what, which one did you use to get like, get that hill slope diffusion into the river network and decide like grain sizes and everything? Uh, we So the network sediment transporter is the component doing the heavy lifting of getting the sediment through. We actually don't have communication between the evolution of the hill slopes that would be advanced. Um, currently, the, uh, the coupling happens from the overland flow sends water levels to the network sediment transporter and that feeds a shear stress that then mobilizes the existing, we, we have to prescribe a sediment thickness and, and that has a grain, grain size distribution to it. And it, it's a Lagrangian transporter that moves parcels down. So that's why you're seeing the full distribution at the output. Cool, thank you. Awesome. I love that there's lively discussion, but I'm also keeping on time a little bit. So like, please type your questions in the chat and like maybe the team can like field those questions back and forth while we move to the next team. Um, um, Rachel Allen will be presenting. Um, and this team worked on Lagrangian particle transport through a tidal estuary. Hi, thanks. Let's get this up. Uh, share screen, full screen. Great, can you guys see this? Yes, we can. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let me make this go away. Um, okay, um, fantastic. Thank you so much. We were project team three um, and we were working on Lagrangian particle transport through a tidal estuary. Um, so, we used three different tools for doing this. Um, the first one was based in LandLab. It was a tidal flow component that was built um, based on a course Coast Morpho 2D model. The second um, was a random grid gen generator, um, GS tools. And then the third was a particle tracking uh, component, um, Dorado, uh, that uh, Jay, one of my teammates actually wrote. So we had a lot of inside knowledge here. And so the overview of what I'm going to talk about today is, um, or the outline of what I'm going to talk about today is an overview of these modeling tools. And we go through the Jupyter notebook that we set up to walk somebody through actually using these. And then some examples from like, you know, the kinds of things that you could test with the, um, with what we set up. All right, so that first model, the tidal flow component is built uh, based on this Coast Morpho 2D model, um, which is in a, a paper by Moriarty and Murshid in 2018. So that model is a 2D model for morphological evolution of a tidal inlet, and it's built uh, with a simplified version of the full Navier-Stokes equations, and it ignores unsteadiness, advection, spa spatial variation, and the water level. And so uh, by making all those assumptions, they can solve for velocity based on an assumed form for the temporal variation of the water surface. And when you do that, you're gonna get column two in this figure here. Um, but like through tidal inlets, inertia can still be important. And so you can do a momentum correction by, and you compute that by balancing bed friction with the inertia term alone. And when you do that and add that on top, you get column three. And so with that full momentum co correction, the Coast Morpho 2D model matches up pretty well with full Navier Stokes solvers like Delft 3 d which is column one here. Um, so that's, that's the tidal component. 
this model is partially integrated to LandLab. Um, the title, model flat, um, title flow model functions. It's not yet a core LandLab component, so you have to do some separate installation. Um, but sediment transport and morph morphology is not yet included. And so the thing that I'm presenting is actually just one of the pieces that our group worked on. Another was trying to get some of the morphological components into the title model. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about it, but it is there is information on it if you're interested. All right, so that was one of the components. The second is GS tools. Um, and this allows you to create a random field with specific properties. So you can use like a Gaussian model and give it a length scale and it'll give you the size of vegetated and unvegetated patches. So that's like what I've got in the top right here. Um, you've got other model options like exponential or return. I don't even know how to say that. Um, but you can also do things like specify anisotropy and rotation. And when you do that, you get something that looks like this. And then the third was the particle, uh, the particle tracking component. And so this simulates the transport of passive particles in a flow field in a Lagrangian fashion um, that was built by Jay. And so we combine these pieces and that allows us to do particle tracking through a random field in tidal flows. All right, so here's the Jupyter notebook. Um, the first thing you gotta do is install some basic libraries. Um, and then we're gonna set a number of parameters that are needed for this model. And in particular, I want you to note the roughnesses. And so the low roughness will be the channel regions and the high roughness is the vegetated regions. Then we generate a random field. So this is the GS tools component. And so when we set the length scale to 20 here, that gives us a vegetated region in yellow and a channel region in blue. Um, that we can then use to spit into the model. Then we take that um, random field generated by GS tools and turn it into a grid for LandLab. And so there's a little bit of conversion here. And here is where we set the roughnesses between the just the zeros and ones that the GS tool spits out and actually assign a roughness value. And so then when we've got the land lab component for the tidal flow calculator, we instantiate it and run it. And then finally, once we've got the uh, land lab model up and running, we add the particles and run them. And so then we can run this through a number of time steps in order to look at the output. And so the visualizations for this, um, we can look at the velocity magnitude on the ebb tide and flood tide, um, as well as how the particles are moving through the system. And so I'm gonna show you a couple examples of this and I wanna just call out the roughnesses and then the length scale as well as a couple other parameters. And so I just did a couple examples to show you how it looks. And so for this one, we I varied the length scale between uh, different runs. Oh, and so flow is allowed through the bottom and the top boundaries and the left and the right boundaries are solid walls here. And so our tidal flow is moving up and down here. Um, and so, the blue regions, like I said, are channels, the yellow regions are vegetated, and after 50 tidal cycles, the particles move from where, from the blue location where they started to the red location at the end of this period. And so you can see when we allow the length scale to increase, we've got more dispersion uh, through the same time, time period with the same forcing. Something else you could try with it is varying the roughnesses. And so that one that I just showed you is here down in the lower right. If you move above it, we've uh, decreased the roughness in the vegetated region, so like thinner plants. Um, as we move over to the left, ooh, as we move over to the left, there's a um, lower roughness in the channel region. So that's saying like, it's not like sort of, it, it, it's a smoother channel. And then down at the bottom is a smoother channel, but the same roughness in the vegetated regions. And you can see here that when you just try these runs, actually allowing a smoother channel in a smoother channel will allow for more dispersion, but changing the roughness between uh, smooth, uh, less rough, less vegetated or more vegetated doesn't actually change dispersion. So it's really tied to how rough the channel is, um, which is kind of a nice test. And then one more example is allowing anisotropy to vary. So in this first region, there's no anisotropy. We've just got a length scale of 10. 
in this region, we've uh, now added some anisotropy. So their length scale of 10 in one direction and three in the other. And then here we're allowing some rotation. So we've changed the direction of the anisotropy to pi over nine here or pi over two in the bottom right. And so that rotation angle defines the direction of, dis of dispersion. You can see it's sort of north south directed in this first figure, it's sort of along the diagonal in this figure. And here it's a little more evenly spread, but almost uh, along that direction of rotation. So with this model, you could look at things like the impact of oil spills or like seed and larval dispersal or fine like non-settling sediment transport. You think about how the veg vegetation scale impacts particle spread, like what's the role of vegetation density. You could think about region connectivity. So what parts of an estuary are easily connected or not at all connected. And if you wanna do any of this, um, all our stuff is on GitHub. Uh, for our coastal team. So it's got the repository and the documentation. That's everything I got. Thank you, Rachel, for a really impressive um, set of simulations and like new capabilities that are like generated by this team. Um, I'm going to open it up for one question and then have other questions in the chat to give the last two teams a little bit more time to like get their stories out to you. Hopefully there's a, a person who wants to like chime in with one question. Um, I see a question from Christian in the chat about do the particles have inertia and gravity? They don't have gravity, they're passive particles. I think they also don't have inertia, they're going along with the flow. Um, so I think it's, it's just like Lagrangian tracking of the particles rather than Eulerian. Um, but Jay, who built this, could really talk more about it. And I think you can probably get in touch with him. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm hoping that you guys keep monitoring the chat a little bit. I see there's a few different. Oh, Greg still has a question. But we'll move on to the project team four. Um, it goes to a completely different scale of geology and time. Um, Gustav Palis, Palisgaard Olesen will be presenting. Uh, he's at Aarhus University, so like phoned in from Europe or zoomed in from Europe. Um, and they, their topic is using LandLab to model tectonic activities in the landscape evolution model. Yep. So I'll see if I can make this work. This is the one. Okay, so I have a couple of screens. Does it does it seem to work? Yeah, we're seeing it all right. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so my name is Costa, and I'm a PhD student at the University of uh, at Aarhus University in Denmark. And uh, the co-authors for this project was Liang Xue and Christian, Xiaoni Hu, Eyal Marder, and and myself. And our uh, project was called uh, using LandLab to model tectonic activities in a landscape evolution model. So, yeah. yeah. So our uh, overall goal was really not to answer a specific research question, it was more to, uh, from the beginning, to create a, a tutorial for undergraduate students. So we're looking at how to model different simple tectonic activities in a landscape uh, using LandLab and how to analyze some key geomorphological features um, with LandLab tools. And um, like a basic outline of, of this tutorial goes through these four uh, sections. So we start out with creating a, a kind of a basic landscape evolution model, which we use in the, in the other sections. Um, and then we go into investigating a little bit um, lithospheric flexure. Um, and in the third section, we add faulting um, and different lithological domains uh, to the model. And then in the last section, we use some of the built-in terrain analysis tools we have in LandLab uh, to analyze a, a uplift event in the, also in the, using the same basic model. So in the first section, we have um, a model setup where we have a uh, 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer uh, grid. We just start out with a 
random landscape, then we use the um, we use steam power, uh, stream power erosion for the uh, fluvial incision. Um, and then we have just regular old um, diffusion erosion for the rest of the landscape. And then we have um, close boundaries in the west, east, and north. Um, and then we run the model through time. So this is uh, an image of how it looks um, in 300,000 years. And uh, to the right um, is just a, an image of sediment discharge or, or um, average erosion during this time, where we see the nick points uh, migrating, reaching the drainage headwaters, and then slowly eroding to steady state. So that's the kind of basic setup for the rest of the um, for the rest of this this few of the sections. Um, yeah, and then we go uh, and have the students investigate. Um, lithospheric uh, flexure. So a very simple setup where uh, the student gets to place a point load on the topography from before, from the basic model, and see the subsidence in the system. So it's a very um, basic 2D um, elastic model. And then we go into the third section. Here we add faulting to the same model. And also we have two different lithological domains with different rotability. So you can see, um, oh, so you can see in this image where we run the model for 100,000 years, um, we see uh, kind of a, a slanted line here, a tilted line. So that's the fault. So it starts uh, somewhere up here and then it, it migrates south. And then we also have this very clear uh, change in lithology or erodibility. It's also, I mean, maybe slightly visible over here. Oh, no, not really, but so um, when the model runs, uh, we see the, the fault propagating, and the um, and then also there's a, a low line created down down here, and then the student gets to look at these through the diff different terrain analysis tools, um, or the the use of these terrain analysis tools like a chi index, deepness index, is kind of explained in this section. And then in the next section, they get to play around with it themselves. So um, here we have a, uh, again, the basic model. Um, so it's run for these uh, 300,000 years. Then we have uh, chosen just uh, some channel we're looking at. And then a spontaneous uplift of 50 meters uh, happens and we run the model until it reaches steady state. So the student gets to look at dif different stuff like chi index, deepness index, some channel slope drainage area um, plots uh, to kind of analyze the evolution of the landscape through through time. So we see here it's very simple nick point migration. Um, so it starts with a steady state, um, and then through some different time slices, we see here in the chi index, we see a nick point uh, migrating through the system, and then uh, after two hundred thousand years or so, um, we have again uh, just a steady state uh, landscape. So that was kind of uh, how we built this, um, this tutorial. And then we, of course, have the students uh, write a little bit of code themselves um, or kind of modifying the existing code um, and also uh, analyze some of the, um, some plots of some of these um, chi index, deepness index graphs um, and, uh, and also create some of them themselves. And then in the, in the end, the, the meaning of the, the exercises that they can themselves uh, try to create some scenario, uh, tectonic scenario, and then um, just copy some of the things um, from the different uh, sections and try to create their own um, model and analyze it themselves. Yeah, so um, I guess- Thank you, Gustav. I can certainly see uh, um, faculty being excited about having this as a tutorial that they can tap into um, or TAs who are like using these uh, to do things with people. Um, is there a question for Gustav and the team who that worked on tectonics? I have a little question. Um, so I agree, this is all very nice and, and excellent teaching material. So thanks a lot to all of you. Um, Gustav, if you plot sediment discharge, is that 
uh, actual sediment discharge measure, measured at a, uh, an outlet, or is it average erosion over the catchment? Yeah, yeah, it was just it was just average erosion really. So we have a couple of different plots, and we're getting the students to plot them. But yeah, it, it's really just average uh, erosion. Yeah. Cool. We'll take if if somebody uh, uh, um, has an additional question, they can type it in the chat, um, and we'll leave it to the team members who are here to like help answer those questions. Um, and we'll move to the last team um, that is a small team, and it's uh, Zen Ming Wu will be presenting um, on land, land geomorphology evolution over continuous permafrost region, um, so a bit more specific to Arctic applications or Tibetan Plateau ex, um, applications. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. You can, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Get it in present okay, tomorrow. Thank you. That's great. So this is the last uh, presentation. It's made by Fen and uh, Mei. So it's we have very small team, just two of us. So this is about the permafrost erosion over a very small catchment by coupling Q model and the diffusion model. So this is overview of what we have done. So the key point here is to, to do some permafrost urine projection by applying Q model and the diffusion model. So we made a Jupyter notebook, but we still didn't upload it to the, the GitHub repository, sorry. This is the main contribution of we have done. It's we made the Q model to be a two, 2D model. The previous example is, is only 1D. I will explain it later. So this is the whole process chain of the of the of the coupling of Q mode and the diffusion model. Uh, let me give a brief brief introduction about the starting error. So we selected a very small catchment in the North Siberia, where is where where is under underlay by sorry where it's underlaid by continuous pump frost. Mm. We can see the, we can see it from the left figure and the right figure shows the topographic details of the study error. So this is the flowchart of the key mode application. So we need to get the active layer thickness first because an LD active layer thickness is one of the key characteristics of the pump frost. It can be used to indicate the state of pump frost. To 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 run to run the Q mode, we need uh, temperature, amplitude of temperature, and the snow depths, and other some information. So here we used we we use the one climate climate station in the in standard error to interplot to interplot all the other informations of temperature and. Uh, amplitude, temperature, snow depths of the each, each pixel. So we know pr previous Q mode example only use one, only use one set of parameter of the whole error. But here in this study, we assume the um, study error as a raster, so which is made by many, many pixels. Then the active layer thickness of each pixel is calculated by applying Q model with specific input parameters so this is after we get the active layer thickness by applying the Q model. So then we need to, to, to input them into the um, diffusion model. But the main, main problem here is we need to think how much, how much of soil is erodible over the pump frost region. So the left figure is the structure of the pump frost. Pump frost. We can see the top layer is active layer and the middle one is pump frost. Which is no, which is generally frozen and uh, quite stable, and so here we take we take the, so in the active layer is regarded as erodible. So after solve this problem, we need to think about DM, which is which is a necessary parameter for the 
DP model to get the slope information. So we also need other, sorry. So we also need other information to, to run the diffusion model such as sorry, generation and the diffus diff diffusivity. Okay, this is the result of active layer estimation of this small catchment. So, so we can see the, of the high and cold region in the east, uh, east part of the study area, we can see the um, quite shallow active layer and in the south, this area is lower warm and quite flat. So we can see the quite deep active layer estimation. So after we get the active layer thickness, then we, did, we, then we put them into the diffusion model. So, so we get the error map of the study area. So this, the, this one is the error map. And uh, if you look at the river back of this error map, we can see the sedimentation in the river beds. Okay, we also did some further investigation about the vegetation coverage, effect of vegetation coverage or the error rate. So we, we can see the left, left two figures is about the vegetation coverage from Google map from 1980s and 2020. And the, the red error is the, is the in the error map, we can see the ch change of the error rate. And this is the simple, simple analysis about the active, active layer thickness and uh, aspect. But to be honest, there's no, no, no correlation between them. And the active layer thickness we estimate in this, in this study area is, is more than one meter. And this is also a small, simple analysis of error rate and aspect. But we can see statistic, statistically, the slope error with aspect between zero to 50 degrees shows a slight, shows a slight sorry, accumulation. So this is our conclusions. The first one is pomposed error rate, error, error estimation process with a 2D Q mode and the diffusion mode was built. And also in the future, if you want to use this, those two coupling models, you, you can consider consider to use the mud, oh sorry, mud process tool in Python. It's because this 2D Q, um, Q model we built is quite uh, computation consuming. It's very slow if, uh, for the 2D calculation. And the third one is you can input more um, accurate parameters, such uh, for example, temperature and snow depths to, in order to get the uh, accurate result. The um, temperature data and the snow depth data we used here is only from one climate station, station which is not very accurate. So which may bias the real result we get. So thanks for your listening. And uh, if you've got any quest question about all this presentation, please contact us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Zenming. Um, I I wanted to compliment the two of you. You are like a, this the smallest team of our uh, of our all our teams in the um, in the Espen Summer Institute for like making actually like a, a real uh, new contribution to this. Um, set of modeling by making everything spatially variable and starting to test that against a real case. Um, so like you were like maybe too modest for uh, in your presentation about your accomplishments. Um, you. I'm opening it up for a question or two. Hey, Irina. Yes. I, I have a slightly broader question. Yes. Go uh, for and this it. is kind of coming from ignorance. Is there a place, a journal, where these could be published? There is a journal of educational open source resources. Oh, right. Isn't that like hope? That is yeah, right. 
It's like right. Josh, but then it's for educational right. too. Right, Jose or something, yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe. Yeah. I mean, or at the very least, like when when everyone's finished, you know, we should make sure that everyone has a, a DOI on the repository so that you mm -hmm. know all the Espenites can take credit for their work and have a citable reference. Yeah, and I, I also want to uh, emphasize to everyone, like make sure you um, like if we build these into the, the CSDMS wiki websites that we have your names on there because it's an educational resource source that you build and you can point to it. And if you if somebody asks you ever like, oh, what did you ever work on teaching material or whatever, then you can say like, well, here it is and it's being used by a larger community. Um, but that DOI idea is a good idea and uh, um, I can definitely send to everyone the, the link to that journal site. Um, it's new and yeah, I don't have much experience with it, so, so I can't vouch for it or anything, but it might be a good idea to, to scope out. Espenite. <laughs> Josie is saying we should be, that like all of you are Espenites now. Well, Mark used the term. I just think okay, it's Mark like it. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any last more general comments that people wanted to make? I want to keep to time because I know like many of you like have like zooms back to back to back. Um, I see some really complimentary comments. Amazing work. People are very impressed. And that's true for like our entire instructor team too. It, it really made a big jump still between us finishing up in August and then and now um, a few few weeks later, a few, not even a couple months, but like a few months. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that um, we had a really intense six days of teaching, but still the um, the products, I think, went way beyond those those days of teaching. So there was a lot of um, work and learning on their own. So this is this is really inspiring, I think, uh, for what our community can and should be doing. Cool. With that, I'm going to conclude. I wanted to thank, thank the teams for all the work that they put in. I wanted to thank the uh, presenters explicitly for stepping up and being the voice for their teams. And I wanted to th thank everybody who's like listening in and we're like hopeful that this is either an inspiration to you to like partake in this in, in the next year or it's an inspiration to use some of these tools or it is a resource um, that you can pull from and use in classes or in teaching moments that you have yourselves. So thank you everyone. We were quite a number of people here. <laughs>